So hi, my name is Andrew Stapleton, and I am an early career researcher. And I want to talk to you today about what the future of early career research looks like for someone like me. When preparing for this talk, I asked a range of ECRs about what they thought their future looked like. The response was an overwhelmingly negative one. Terms like bleak, non-existent, unstable, and unrealistic were regularly muttered. These are people that feel like they have delayed participating in adult life, like having children, buying houses, under the misconception that doing a PhD and further postdoctoral studies will increase the amount of job opportunities. Maybe some 10 years ago, these same people would have finished some research, found a teaching or lecturing position or a research position in a university where they would grow old and gray. They would have worked long, hard hours in the lab. They would have produced science that stood up to the process of peer review. And perhaps in there, they maybe would have even enjoyed themselves. The fact is, my own individual effort is no longer good enough. I need to find the right collaborators, the right projects, and work the hardest I've ever worked just to be competitive. Unfortunately, even the very best ECRs are not guaranteed a position at the end of all that hard work. In 2009, a UK study showed that only 15% of ECRs were in a lecturer position between six and nine years outside of their PhD. To put that in perspective, that is the same chance that I have of getting shingles. <laughs> so the question is, why bother? <laughs> Every ECR has a desire to work things out. And I want to share with you a story. I used to love taking things apart as a child. I once, I once learned about the vibrational dynamics of a rotating spindle with off-center mass when I stumbled upon a gadget in my mum and dad's room. <laughs> Neither my mum or dad knew where that came from. But the fact is, the system that we've created creates, uh, creates really disenfranchised researchers who feel like they gain proportionally little from the huge amount of effort they put in. So the question is, why are these people doing it? Why, after, the, after some undergraduate sort of training, why would they then go on to a number of indeterminate years of hard work and pressure? Well, some love it. Some love it more than socializing, more than eating, and from personal experience, some like it more than taking care of their own personal hygiene. Those people are in the minority. We have created a caricature of this research student. In reality, and arguably, the most, uh, the, the most of the PhD students go on because it's the path of least resistance. That is not the path of least work. But they do an undergraduate course. They cannot find a job. Why not do honors? At the end of honors, they can't find a job. Why not then get paid to go to university? What a great deal. And do a PhD. The harshest of critics will say the reason they're doing it is because it's a Ponzi or pyramid scheme. That is, one, where extraordinary returns are promised on an original investment. The promoter sells shares to the investors by taking advantage of a lack of investor knowledge or competence. Now, if I was really mean, I could change that to say, Better job prospects are typically promised on the completion of a PhD. The research leader sells the PhD to students by taking advantage of, their, uh, of a lack of student knowledge or competence. Now, that's really mean. But every PhD student that I spoke to hadn't received independent career counseling. Now, if we follow this motif of a pyramid scheme, there are research leaders that have these grand ideas. They rely on attracting a huge number of postdocs or early career researchers and PhD students to test their theories for them. They need to attract them with this idea of creative satisfaction, that idea that you can follow an idea and, it, and make it your own. We, offer, we promise them publications and notoriety. The problem is, in this system, yes, the research leader does gain the most from the efforts of the people below them. And this is known as the Matthew effect, where the uh, where the credit that, could sh that surely should go to the workhorse of the, of the modern lab, the postdocs and the PhD students, is given to the research leaders. Now, this is not 
the end of the story. Above the researchers, obviously, are the university. The research leaders are the result of this system. The research leaders work hard to produce lots of science, and the reason they do that is because they are valuable then to the university. They will bring in money for the university. Some people do make it. Some people pop their head above the cloud of the academic haze. Okay? That does not mean they do not deserve it. In fact, it means they have worked incredibly hard to get there. Um, the, but the unfortunate reality is that there's even more early career researchers who are equally as capable, equally as passionate, and work long hours in the lab, and they fall by, by, uh, by the wayside because they are trained in an archaic system that serves only to satisfy the, universe of, yeah, the, the requirements of the university. In 2012, a study followed 21 pairs of researchers with equal track record. So that means they're equally good scientists. Of the pairs that split, where one stayed in academia and the other went to industry, the difference was luck. It wasn't how hard they worked, it wasn't how much time they spent in the lab, or even perhaps ability. Now, it's very easy to paint research leaders as these fat cats of the, in their offices, smoking drugs, <laughs> uh, shooting off guns and participating in group sex. <laughs> I don't think they actually do that. But the fact... <laughs> I don't know. But the fact is um, that these people do care deeply about the students they train. They fight hard and long for grants they almost certainly won't get against other successful research leaders. Now, this is our glimmer of hope. At the end of last year, the Royal Society produced a document which tried to outline the ways that we can sort of control the, the uh, aspirations of PhD and early career scientists. And I want to draw two points from this. First one, of course, PhD students and ECRs need to control the projection of their own careers, but they need independent advice to make that decision. At the moment, they're getting advice from people with a vested interest in their outcomes, and that needs to change. Secondly, the universities should be required to provide the research students with independent training alongside their studies to increase the amount of transferable skills that they gain so that when they graduate, they are competitive in the job environment into which they will graduate. I'd like to take uh, a kind of example from, from music. Now, imagine if your child come up to you and said, I want a career in music. We know what the stock standard response is. That's nice, darling, but make sure you have a backup plan. Science will need to take this same, this same uh, approach. Sure. Some will become rock stars of the scientific world, but the fact is most will not. We need to make sure that the ones after the ideas of scientific rock stardom drop away have the appropriate skills to be employable. This idea that an uh, alternate career is one outside of the ivory towers is wrong, old-fashioned, and disingenuous to the students we train. So what do I think the future looks like? We need independent career advice. In Germany, the PhD is not only marketed as sort of higher education, a pathway to academia, it's also higher training for the workforce. So we need these people, these PhD students, to control their own uh, projection with independent career advice. We need to train industry to appreciate us and the skills we, get, we, we have. I've applied for jobs and other people have applied for jobs, and industry have said to me, you haven't got the job because you're overqualified, and you won't enjoy it. I'm afraid, industry, that's not your choice to make. We need to stop the brain drain. In Australia, ECRs are leaving the country at enormous rate. We've, they're a valuable resource, and we need to use them. A society in which there are more trained individuals can only be a good thing, provided they can actually contribute to the society in which they graduate. Thank you.